Yeah. Welcome to the Youth Voice, a podcast giving young people a voice in politics and across the island of Ireland. So today we're joined by Professor Colin Harvey of Queen's University Belfast. Professor, obviously you've done a lot of work on constitutional law, human rights law, you've looked a lot about kind of a New Ireland and that kind of whole movement of constitutional change. So welcome to the show on that. Uh, I'm really Thank you, Dermot. Straight. Delighted to be here. <laughs> I'm ready to get straight in if you are. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had an interest in your for constitutional politics anyway. We've seen threats to pull down the Assembly from kind of both, you know, Bush and Fianna on to the DUP. We've seen, you know, there's a kind of right, especially this year, a massive move, like, I suppose, rise in the movements towards constitutional change, particularly on the border question. And there's been massive like talks about mandatory coalition. We've seen a lot of possible radical change this year. But I wanted to get your thoughts on what's happening with the DUP and their threats to pull down the assembly over the NI protocol. What are your thoughts on that? Like, what is that, you know, kind of going to mean for everyday people? And what do you think? I think, first of all, a lot, lot of the things are an outworking of Brexit itself. And, you know, d don't really need to repeat, Dermot, to yourself or your audience that the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union. So in some senses, the protocol is an outworking of all of that and is really a, a mitigating measure to try and mitigate some of the worst dimensions of that. And people have talked about the opportunities of the protocol, but it's obviously caused quite a serious debate and the extent of opposition within the unionist community is clear. I, I don't think the suggestion of pulling down the institutions at the moment is a very sensible one. I um, don't think it's really the responsible thing to do at the moment. Obviously, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic and that, you know, the resurgence of the new variant uh, means that, you know, pulling down institutions at the moment seems to be irresponsible, really, and not not the right way forward. There's also mechanisms within the protocol itself and there's institutional architecture there to try and resolve disagreements. You know, the British government and the European Commission, European Union are in negotiations at the moment. So, you know, in some senses, you have to let those mechanisms function and work. And I think there's a good faith attempt, for example, at the moment from the European Union to try and address some of the difficulties that have been identified. And I just don't think pulling down the institutions at the moment is very helpful. It seems, it, honestly, I think we, were, we talked to Rachel Woods about two weeks ago, and she said that one of the few things that is ever stable is the level of inst instability in Northern Ireland and in our politics, which I suppose is very difficult to disagree with her there. But do you think that, you know, political instability, um, that whole, you know, the constant threat of, pulling down storm do you, like is that having in at least from your view like real real world effects on people and kind of on our politics like do you think that is having an effect on how we go about politics because we could at any moment see the whole thing come crashing down we have a very divided society still and we are a post-conflict society in which um you know we've moved beyond violent conflict but a lot of the very deep political disagreements that were there are still there today. And in some senses, they're being fought out within the context of, you know, institutions that are there. The institutions are supposed to manage that and allow, you know, governance to, to go forward in a practical way. I suppose, you know, you're right. Your question, particularly in the areas that I work in, around equality and human rights and social justice, even areas like climate justice as well, I think there's the real feeling that been any casualties of the mechanisms that are there. This was a tragedy in all of that is that, you know, there are proposals around enhancing human rights here, proposals around equality and social justice, and they've never been implemented. Um, and to I feel sorry for that, in that are the people in this society, particularly most marginalized and vulnerable people who need those rights to be there. So in a sense, you're right, the nature of our mechanisms uh, don't help, uh, and often equality and rights feel like the sort of collateral damage and casualty of that. But you know they're not there by accident; they're there for a reason. And also, sometimes you know, I've increasingly felt this in recent weeks. People should 
simply call things out for what they are. You know, there, there's a terrible tendency here to, oh, everybody's as bad as you. Sometimes I think, you know, it's, that's actually not true. You know, there, there are clearly identifiable blockages and people just need to name them sometimes. Um, ultimately, just to end that point, I think most people here, it's clear from the evidence I've seen, want change in these areas. So it's how can we allow the institutions to you know, unleash that appetite for change at the moment. I suppose that'll be a big question after the assembly elections next May and in terms of the sort of executive that emerges in the light of that. Um, I suppose you mentioned a lot on rights and equality there and social justice. We're seeing from the Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab, possible changes to the Human Rights Act and essentially, I think what has been called as common sense reform, which... For a lot of people, when it comes to a conservative government, that's that's scary, and that can be quite intimidating. But what are yeah. your thoughts on you know possible changes, and what is what does you know obviously your background is in human rights. What does that mean for you know people like you and me, ordinary people who aren't you know who aren't well? I mean, you're a legal expert, but I'm you know I'm not. I'm I'm seventeen. I don't really know very much about human rights yeah. law. But what does that mean for ordinary people, and what could what can we expect? Well, the starting point is that people are right to be scared about what's being proposed. It's dressed up in a certain way um, by Dominic Raab, but the Conservative Party and this government have been sceptical about the Human Rights Act for a long time. They've been promising to repeal and then replace it with something called you know, a British Bill of Rights. And the proposals today, they're talking about revising and replacing the Human Rights Act as part of their attempt to, to overhaul it. I think people are right to be very, very nervous because historically, and looking at the proposals today, there's a fear that that's about watering down rights rather than enhancing rights. Now, when you're you know, adopting or proposing new human rights measures, and that's wrapped around with the language that you want to be able to deport more people, <laughs> that doesn't sound like a very human rights friendly starting point. So people are nervous. People here are also nervous because the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there's a commitment there in the British government to incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights into Northern Ireland law. And the Human Rights Act does that, uh, combined with our devolution legislation as well. So I think there's a real fear and nervousness that when the Conservatives are, are having a go with the Human Rights Act, that will have implications for the Good Friday Agreement too. And also keep in mind, that was just our starting point. That was basically the starting point, the, fl- the floor, if you like. We were supposed to have a more expansive Bill of Rights containing a, a broader range of protections that built on that, and that has never happened. The Human Rights Commission submitted its advice on the 10th of se- December 2008. There's been a committee uh, up in the Assembly meeting that's adjourned recently for reasons that, that may be widely known that uh, was supposed to report in February, but we were supposed to have a Bill of Rights that went beyond the Human Rights Act, but what we're seeing today uh, from the Conservative government is the potential to to water down those rights, and that will affect everyone in society because human rights are for everyone, but it'll affect in particular those people who need rights most, you know, who need those protections uh, to matter. And the the area that I'm particularly uh, concerned about is that, you know, in the advice from the Human Rights Commission, I was involved in the Human Rights Commission at the time, we propose a range of basic socio economic rights in law, and I think they're often widely neglected, but they're rights that people across all communities want to see delivered. We did polling earlier in the year with Ulster University, Queen's and the Human Rights Consortium that confirmed that. In areas like healthcare and housing, people want to see basic human rights guaranteed. So I think it's, it's disappointing news. People are right to be worried and scared, but also it isn't a done deal yet. So in the reactions to it and the responses that, that come from Northern Ireland. Hopefully people will make their voices very clear in that, including young people. And on the NI Bill of Rights, it has been something that has kind of floated about the political agenda for the last, you know, I suppose, o- over a decade now. What what should be, like, we have the Human Rights Act, what should be kind of included in an extended NI Bill, Bill of Rights? Like, what should we kind of be expecting from our politicians to put forward in that and expecting, you know, you're an expert on it, you're yeah. obviously involved in it. Yeah. So what should 
your average person out there and be expecting from that bill and what should be on it and um, what can we hope for um, yeah. I suppose what is the situation there yeah well Dermot it's a, it's a great question just to sketch the background the uh, the remit for the Bill of Rights process here is contained in the Good Friday Agreement and that job was given to the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission to come up with advice that advice was submitted as long ago as 2008 in a process that was launched on the 1st of March 2000 and that advice has never been legislated for. Uh, my view would be that's a responsibility and this agreement makes clear responsibility is on the Westminster government to legislate that hasn't happened. The sorts of rights that we're talking about in the Bill of Rights is building on the civil and political rights that are in uh, the Human Rights Act, the European Convention on Human Rights to include social and economic rights in areas such as housing, healthcare, uh, employment, uh, areas that really the bread and butter human rights issues that often matter to people most. Also just guaranteeing in law some of the things that we hear a lot about here around culture and identity and mutual respect and parity of esteem. One of the things that the Human Rights Commission uh, noticed was that uh, a lot of these commitments in the Good Friday Agreement weren't actually legislated for domestically and we recommended that they should be. And my sense is that would have addressed a number of the difficulties that we've experienced um, down the years in that particular area. Additional things like a very strong and robust equality guarantee, and even looking back on the advice now, a commitment to environmental rights in there as well, and making those all enforceable so that you and I, uh, people out there can actually enforce them in a court of law so they're meaningful in practice. So that's a broad range of rights. That's a sketch of the process. It's really, really disappointing that it hasn't advanced. The ad hoc assembly committee that was set up to uh, deal with this has adjourned. Uh, the reasons for the adjournment in November, one of which uh, your interviewee today is somewhat caught up in that. And so it's, my, it's been reported that one of the reasons it hasn't advanced is because of a reluctance to put me on the panel for it. So um, it, it, that feels rather personal, but there's a bigger issue there. And I think ultimately, people listening to this. Uh, children's rights, rights of children and young people too, should just feel very, very disappointed that the promises from the agreement in this and other areas, they've, they've just never been delivered and that would have made this place better. So that's, there's, a, there's a tragic element to that, I think. Um, moving on from rights, you've obviously done a lot of work on constitutional change, looking at whether you know, it'll be in you know, constitutional change within Northern Ireland or constitutional change as an on an on a, on Ireland basis, but what are you? Obviously, you've been very in support of possibly the United Ireland, the Shared Ireland, the New Ireland. There's a lot of different names for it, but it is usually su suggesting the same thing. But from a kind of legal standpoint, what does in your eyes that kind of New Shared or United Ireland kind of look like in terms of structure almost? Well, I think there's a few th things there just to take a step back in terms of the context. Again, we're back at the Good Friday Agreement, which makes absolutely clear that the constitutional status of Northern Ireland rests on consent. There's a principle of consent that is in that document that's also you know, in international law and guaranteed in domestic law in both states. And the right of self-determination, you know, the people of the island of Ireland have a right to determine their own future. And that, that is settled. It's there. And politics and law and it's sort of repeated all the time so really the work constitutionally out of that is that flows from the sense in which we need to sketch out what that all means in two senses first of all we need to be clear what the process is so if there is going to be an exercise of concurrent consent on the island of ireland to determine the constitutional future it would be nice to sketch out what that actually means in practice so a lot of people, not just myself, but a number of academics and academic institutions have been thinking about, for example, the referendum process, what that will look like, the nature of the question and all that. But you're right, you know, the debate is now moving on to not just what the process will be, but that if a referendum happens, what are the proposals uh, that will be on the table? And in terms of that, there are a number of things. You know, one thing is, on principle, there's been a strong emphasis on citizens and civic and people's engagement in processes to design all of that. So you'll have noticed, for example, that a number of individuals, organizations like Ireland's Future have called for an All-Island Citizens Assembly to be established. I think that comes out of a, 
a space in which it shouldn't be academics like me sitting in my uh, or others you know handing down on tablets of stone sort of designs for the future that should be done from organically discussing with people i think what we're heading towards and we're thinking about this a lot in recent weeks is something that looks like on either side of that debate sort of manifestos or prospectus or some kind of set of proposals actually whether that's for remaining within the uk or for constitutional change on this island a reunified ireland and i think that's a, actually a really interesting exciting debate in which although sometimes there's a nervousness people have about participating i would encourage everyone to do so because it's a chance to talk, discuss, design proposals for the future. And I think that conversation, although there's a lot of ideas already there, is at a very early stage. And we're beginning to see in recent weeks more polling and interventions and suggestions around that. Um, very interesting last week, for example, to see young Fine Gael, for example, have started a consultation process uh, working towards a paper what a united ireland would look like so ultimately i would say on, on whatever side of the debate you're on just get involved have your say you know what would you like to see for the future of this island however you frame it shared island united ireland new ireland new reconciled shared island whatever combination just i think it's an exciting time to be involved in a bigger discussion about the future but i would say dermot that that, that much of that particularly for those who want this to be new and transformative that's at a an early stage of that discussion so it's a great great opportunity for the listeners of this podcast and everybody to to just join in to organize your own discussion to start your own conversation group you know that's a number of us have done that you know nobody you know told in a sense we just you know set these things up and have the discussion so i'd encourage anybody listening to this podcast to do likewise you know it's a wonderful time to be engaged in this debate, albeit the circumstances are challenging, albeit that it's been propelled forward by Brexit and what that's done to the island. I think it also gives opportunities to. On the idea of, you know, I, I know you mentioned polls and that kind of thing. I know over Henry and shared this the other day, but some polling has suggested that, at least with my generation, a United almost almost looks inevitable almost with, you know, polling suggesting next seven out of ten young people in the north want to see United Ireland, which is quite significant, I suppose. Like that's that's an entire generation. And I think that was the 18 to 25 age group. So that's yeah. you know that's a lot of voters. Yeah. Do you think there's a lot of people who do feel that it is inevitable. Do you share that view? I don't think very much in life is inevitable. So I actually don't and I've had this discussion with a few people. I I don't think it's inevitable and the reason i say this is human history uh you're studying history dermot at the moment right so you know that there are multiplicity of political projects in human history that people sat around saying were inevitable and uh, that never happened um, and i think the inevitability argument just encourages while i understand it entirely given the trends it encourages complacency and it discourages the sort of hard work that's needed now to build a case. And why do I say that? Because the polling that I've seen in recent weeks, the polling is, would you vote for United Ireland tomorrow? That's okay asking that question, but nobody has a clue what United Ireland far looks like. What's the substance of that proposal? So, you know, I'd much rather people, you know, got on, on either side of the debate with doing the work, building their case, you know, developing persuasive arguments, encouraging inclusive conversations to sort of build the argument. But I don't think anything is inevitable, particularly in the North, Northern Ireland, you know, in terms of how people might vote in a referendum now or even a number of years time, um, they'll need to be persuaded. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a fluidity about identity as well today. And I know we are often quite monolithic, but I think things are melting to some extent where there are a range of persuadable people uh, and when you have a lot of persuadable people, then nothing is necessarily inevitable. They'll have to be persuaded either way. And I suppose one of the, I think I'll finish up on this one is there is obviously the conversation is happening. You're part of it yourself. You're on the board of Ireland's future. So it's something that you're obviously quite passionate about. 
But with young people, I suppose one of the big thing is we've seen you know young Fine Gael over Sinn Féin over Fianna Fáil, all the kind of youth wings are kind of getting involved in that conversation. But like myself, I'm I'm not in the party. How can young people get involved in that conversation? I know that you know young people can talk about it amongst themselves. But when it comes to that kind of civic movement and actually getting involved and shaping what the future of Ireland is going to look like, how can young people get involved in that? It's a good point. And I noticed they highlighted the political party dimension to it. And some people, very understandably, won't want to be involved in political party conversations. That's why I think civic uh, community groups, the work of non-governmental organizations, which essentially Ireland's future is, which is a civic organization that is you know, definitively not party political in terms of the work it tries to do, is that becoming involved in those civic initiatives, joining them, shaping them, helping to drive their direction. Um, but I'd also underlined another point I mentioned earlier, is you know, I'd encourage people to initiate their own organic discussions among like-minded people. And, you know, you can spend your life joining things that other people establish, but sometimes initiating your own uh, group, your own conversation, uh, having those discussions yourself can be, in fact, more rewarding in the longer term. So I, I know what you mean. I think, you know, join existing uh, civic conversations and groups like Ireland's Future, follow the work that's ongoing there. Uh, start your own initiatives around this. But also, I would say, Dermot, to listeners today, something that always puzzles me is that constitutional preferences here are supposed to be equally legitimate. A number of your listeners will be involved in a range of organizations, civic, you know, perhaps political others, you know, even working or engaged with public bodies. Sometimes you also have to ask the question of a community group, or of a public body, have you thought about this? Have you done any work on this? Who have you talked to about it? And if you haven't, why haven't you? So sometimes I would say just asking the question can also be a very, very useful thing to do. But ultimately, Dermot, your listeners, yourselves, you know, I'm getting on a bit in life now, right? But you're going to have to live in this space. And my view on this would be whatever side of the argument people end up, that it's a remarkable opportunity to proactively shape the future. Yes, at a turbulent time, at a difficult time, at a time of anxiety for people of all ages. But, you know, I think the opportunities to participate and involve in, in, in essentially shaping the future of the space that you inhabit, wherever it ends up constitutionally, just a remarkable legacy, historic moment. You know, I think we are living in one of those moments. You know, there's times when nothing much happens and then times a lot happens in a short space of time. Can't remember who has a very famous quote around that, but it's something along those lines much better than that. Um, but that's, this is it. So, you know, participate, engage, initiate your own discussions, chance to, to shape a future that you're going to have to live in and inhabit, so, so make it a good one. Absolutely. I mean, we're obviously here at the Youth Voice, we're all about getting young people involved. So if it is something young people are interested in, and any of our listeners, if you are interested in having that conversation about debating it, then you know, absolutely reach out. I know we're probably going to do a debate yeah. between young people about that very soon. Hopefully in the new year, I think we'll celebrate the uh, first birthday of our last debate, so we'll probably do yeah. another one in January time. Yeah. Dermot, well, can maybe mention something around all that in terms of, like, I, I think, you know, the work that you're doing, you an absolutely central role in asking very challenging questions about your generation and what some of these rhetorical terms mean, you know. So when people use the word new in this new Ireland, a bit, well, what do they mean in terms of issues like climate justice? In, in areas like socioeconomic rights, you know, what, what will that all mean? And I think you have an absolutely central role in, you know, in promoting and facilitating really hard questions and having those debates about the future. You know, and just want to commend you and all the work that you're doing to do precisely that in the here and now. It's a particularly difficult time to be doing any of this. 
But I know we we did discuss. I think we discussed the possibility of being added Ireland on the last on the last kind of round table debate we had. So I think it's definitely it's something we're going to have to definitely look at again this right. year. I know we only really touched on it once, and we touched on it with a few TDs and that kind of thing, but we haven't really gotten into it with young people properly. So yeah. for anyone that's listening to that, please, please do reach out, you know, get involved, yeah. you know, drop me an email, drop me, drop, you can always message us at Youth Voice NI on Twitter or at Youth Voice underscore NI on Instagram. You know, do, do reach out. But I think we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, Professor. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Dermot. Very much appreciate the invitation. And to anyone listening, as always, thank you for listening. As I said before, you can reach us on our socials. Read our blog, www.ufoicni.com. There are, I think there's at least one or two articles up there about constitutional change. I know I wrote one on education. So for anyone interested in that, give it a read. As always, I've been Dermot Hamill, and we'll see you all next time.